been so good to us. Uh, we're getting ready to celebrate, Lord willing, here Independence Day. And thank God for the freedoms that which we still have and enjoy, uh, freedom of worship and speech and so forth. And we are to thank God for that. Our youth, uh, if they will at this time, they're going to come and lead us in a couple of songs and whatever the Spirit moves them to do. And when they get through singing, those that can enable, like come in around the altar, we'll go to the Lord in prayer and take a prayer request.
I've been commissioned. Yeah.
boys are happy when that's promised it's over in that great beyond where all the saved of earth we're soon gonna share the is broken.
Sounds like a bird in prison I will No freedom from the sorrow I felt But Jesus came and he listened to me And glory to God He set me free He set me free Yes, he set me free He broke the bonds of prison for me Uh, my intentions were there since the men came up around the altar, but just keep it flowing. Yeah. 
and I couldn't see Sherry there and things, but I see just keep things moving right along there. And uh, that's where God inhabits. The, when praises go up, God inhabits the praise of His people. Praises go up, blessings come down. And God's been so good to us. Hey, He watched over you last night, woke you up this morning, give you strength to get up out of bed. You may have been a little bit, not have perfect health, may sound like Rice Krispies, Snap, Crack, and Pop. But if you got out of bed, you ought to thank God if you're able to stand on your feet. Amen. It's the truth. Hey, folks, truthfully, we shouldn't have to be primed up. We should be coming in the house of God, entering His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Well, uh, Sister Brenda and Gary Hunt is going to sing to us now, and, and uh, we want them to come at this time. She's a, this is her home church, and uh, we appreciate them ever so much. Uh, Gary, you're going to sing one with her later or something, ain't you? All right. All right. But she's such a blessing. She's anointing, anointed of God, and we appreciate them ever so much. So let's continue the worship. appreciate that youth choir too. I was asked to sing a couple songs with them. I didn't know they was going to keep me forever. But, <laughs> but I am such, I'm, I'm so thrilled because some of those children I saw when they came into this world. And, and I'm so thankful and blessed to be a part of, of this youth. And um, I'm so thankful to be here tonight. I'm a little nervous. Gary asked me why and I said I don't know. I said I just because I feel like if I don't get nervous I'm not doing it for the right thing. And I want my light to shine for Him. I want to be a true light for those out in the world that when they see me, they'll say that there's something different about her. And I do have a few requests tonight, so I know you all have heard these forever, but um, I do have a few requests. So. Letting go of every single dream one down at your feet every moment of my wandering never changes what you see I try to win this war I confess my hands are weary I need your tomorrow brings there's not a day ahead you have not seen so in all things be my life and breath I want what you want Lord and nothing less when you don't move the mountains I need you to move when you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through 
for a kingdom that is not my own. I'm living for eternity, laying up treasures in my heavenly home, setting my mind on things above and not here below. to take everybody with me. Everybody I meet, all the family, neighbors, friends. But you know, I can't do that. I can't make them come down and kneel at an altar prayer. I'd love to. I'd love to lock the doors and just make them all come. Okay, I'd rather see them all at an altar prayer praying than going out that door. But I can't do that. All I can do is pray. And you know, that's all we all can do is pray. I know we all have family and friends that's lost. But one of these days, if they don't give their heart to Jesus, it's going to be too late. They're going to be standing outside the ark door, aren't they? But I am thankful tonight that I have Jesus in my heart. I love him with all my heart. And, and like Brother David said, this is our home church. And, and we've been missing here for three years. But we'd like to see every one of you ever once in a while again. So we're so thankful to be back. And, and I love each and every one of you. And some I don't know, it's new faces. And that's wonderful because you're growing. And that's wonderful. <clears throat> I started singing this song around Easter time, and uh, it's become one of my favorites, so I'm going to sing it. Never 
I'm going to do one more and then I'll have Gary come up and help me sing one. <clears throat> well, okay, come on up. We'll just do it. That's okay. I was debating on that anyway, so this is the Lord telling me to sit down. <coughs> you know, that song that he, you can't tell us he didn't love us and what love he had. He spread his arms out on that cross just for me and for each and every one of you. It's good to be here tonight. Good to be back to Hickory Grove. Miss you all. I know you don't miss me, but I miss you all. But anyway, you know, God's good. God is good. Uh, got voted back in for my third year. God's been good to the church. God's been good. Real quickly, June 25th, 34 years ago, me and Brenda got married. I sat in my chair the other day and the Lord said, when he calls me Gary, I know he means business. He said, you remember what I've done for you 34 years ago? In about two more weeks, I think. I said, Lord, I remember what you've done for me. He said, you remember I raised you from the dead? And I said, yes, sir. Do you remember what the angel told you at the heaven's gates? I said, yes. He told me, tell everyone I see what you've done for me. He said, you're doing a good job at it. Keep it up. You know, that means a lot to me. When the Father knows I'm doing his will, it means the whole world to me. This song here, Gary Mason does it way better than I do. But I fell in love with this song, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. <laughs> Number one would surely be me. I thought I would be what I wanted to be. I thought I would be. Yeah. 
I'll say something about you real quick. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep praising the Lord. I met this young fellow and lady right here. Did y'all ever find your other singer? He took off running out there and saw him again. But I'm going to tell you, they're amazing. When they sung Cal that night at the youth camp, they sung right into this old boy's heart. I tell you, they loved the Lord. They loved the Lord. Didn't they, Scott? They had their self a time. And they had their self a time. When I got here, I said, I want your phone number, sir. He's going to come to my church one day. I tell you, keep the young people busy. Keep them busy. Now, real quick, I got a two-year-old little girl in my church. Cal, she runs around the church, both hands raised in the air. She went around 20, 30 times. I get up to preach, come, she says, take me. She preaches with me. When I preach, she'll jab her a little bit and raise her little hands. Folks, don't you dare tell them kids they can't do that. Because they ain't the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Brenda. Such a blessing, I tell you. We've been friends for years and years. And uh, I know he gave you just a tiny bit about his history and what he's been through. But he is a miracle in the church. A lot of you prayed for that miracle. Some people say that it's a miracle, but he's an absolute miracle. Uh, God spared him from death, and he uses his life to testify of the goodness of the Lord. And I always love it when I'm out preaching somewhere and I see him come in. Because I think if nobody else is going to get blessed tonight, Gary's going to get blessed. We're going to have church. And I don't mean that in a bad way. There's some people that, you know, they just... They just come prepared, and they're going to worship the Lord if nobody else does. And we ought to live our life like that. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Church. Thank you, Youth Group, for having me back again. I'm an old man now, and you still have me come and preach this meeting that the youth sponsor. But I, I do appreciate you. Thank the Lord for you. And it is great to have my wife along again tonight in service with us. I'm so thankful for what the Lord has done for her. And then also the Ward family with us. Uh, Josh, one of the preachers in the church. And uh, his dear wife is a primary care provider for Candy and I. And they take time, them and their kids, to come and be with us. And by the way, I have to mention uh, their little girl, she loves to sing. And every now and then she'll just get up in the choir where we're at and make Josh take her up. She's always a blessing. And Judson, stand up there, Judson. I'll make you stand up everywhere. Can't hardly see him. <laughs> Judson's dad's not only a preacher, Josh's not only a preacher, but Judson's a preacher. You heard me right. He, he's a preacher. And we praise God for him. And uh, I, I was there probably when he preached his first sermon. Well, no, he preached his first one in junior church. I was upstairs preaching, I think. But second sermon, he's getting out and about, going different places. God's been using him, and we are so thankful. So anytime God has his hand on young people, we want to we encourage them and encourage them to keep doing what the Lord's called them to do. And I never dreamed, you know, when Sam was the age that he was, I watched him grow up in our church. I never dreamed that he would be the fireball preacher and singer that he is now. But I don't know anybody that loves singing and preaching any better than Sam. And I'm glad that we could... Yeah, the Lord's been good to us, and I'm glad when we come down to these days of our life that Candy and I can look and say, Lord, uh, maybe, maybe we've been a blessing in some way to help people, and to try to show them. I know one thing, they sure are a blessing to us, to watch them grow up and serve the Lord, doing what they're doing. Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, good, don't get nervous when I take you here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, one verse I'm looking at tonight. I'll make reference to several other verses in this chapter, but in the 13th verse of the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Corinthians was a very confused church. They had a lot of things going on. They started in the right direction, and soon they were misled. False doctrines came in, and they were following people that were no longer teaching the truth, and they took the good things of God and started to confound them and started to confuse the people. And before long, the people started turning on one another. By the time the Apostle Paul writes this letter, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, deception inside the church. And people are being deceived. They're being told things that's not biblically accurate. They're being told things that they know that God 
did not send the individual to tell them, but yet they were believing them. And as a result of that, they started to leave the basics. And can I say this to you? Don't leave the fundamentals of the gospel out. There's some things that you need to stay with no matter what. And when we get to the 13th verse of this chapter, this is called the love chapter because the, the Greek word for charity, that's also the same word that's used for love. But I think that this is love in a different descriptive way than what you read it in other passages of the scripture. And he says, and now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. And he goes on to say, but the greatest of these is charity. Now abideth. That word abideth is a great word. That's telling us from God's own lips there's some things that's going to last. Now in life, if you live long enough, you're going to find out you're going to lose some things. There'll be things you want to keep that you can't keep. There'll be things that you'll get that will not last. There'll be people that will start the journey that won't stay with you. There'll be friendships and friends will leave you. There'll be times that you'll be disappointed in life with the occurrence of life. Your health may leave you. You may have a job that you love, but suddenly the place that you work, they may leave and leave you without a job. People may leave you and you may lose a lot of things in life. But he tells us plain, these three things are the things that we need to make sure we have left when everything else is gone. We'll lose some things for certain. He says there's a lot of things that's important. And the devil wants to try to attack these three things. You know every attack that he gives you in your life, he attacks you because in the end, he's trying to impact faith, hope, and charity in your life. He's trying to eventually use those things to get to your faith, get to your hope, get to your love and charity. He's trying to stop you any way that he can. But the Lord's saying you need to take these three things to heart. And no matter what else you lose, make sure you don't lose faith. Make sure you don't lose hope. And make sure you don't lose love or charity. Because you have to have those three things when everything else is gone. See, really, Satan don't want your car. What's he going to do with the car? All he does is give you car trouble to try to keep you from serving the Lord and getting to church where your faith will be built again. He doesn't want your car. He's trying to get to your faith. He doesn't want your house. He doesn't need a house to live in. He's just trying to attack you through the possessions you have to try to make you somehow lose hope. He doesn't want your health. That's not what he wants. But he'll attack your health to try to somehow make you lose your charity and your love, your faith, and your hope. Yep. All of those things that you're going through, he's trying to somehow, trying to make you surrender those things. If we're not careful, we'll guard the things in life that really don't matter. He gives three areas that we spend a lot of time trying to guard. He said we make sounds. If you go to the first part of this chapter and start reading, he said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. A lot of people, they try to hold on to those sounds that they make. It's great to make sounds for the Lord. It's great to praise God. It's great to rejoice. We guard those things, and then we guard making sacrifices. He goes on to say, though I give my body to be burned, I offer all the sacrifices, I'll guard those sacrifices. People will guard the sacrifices they make to the Lord. But that's fine, but if you let faith, hope, and charity go, your sacrifice means nothing. If you don't give your sacrifice by love, then it has no meaning. I know people that will sacrifice their time, they'll sacrifice their efforts, but they are so bitter in their heart that it has no effect on others. If you do it without love, it'll never impact others. He goes on to say, 
though I make sense. We guard the things that make sense. He said, though I, I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I'm nothing. You can know it all and not have it all. See, you can know everything there is in this Bible. There was a king one time that he was overthrown. They put him in prison. Put him in prison. The only thing that he had was a Bible. He wasn't a Christian. He started reading that Bible, memorizing the Bible. He went through every word, every verse. He was in prison for nearly 20 years. He knew the Bible inside out. He started noting things like the, name, the word girl only is mentioned one time in the Bible. He'd take notes. He had all types of strange notes about the Bible. He, he counted every word of the Bible. He knew how many words, how many letters, how many books. He knew all about the Bible. Yet at the end of, the life, of his life, he died without Christ. You can have all the knowledge there is of this book. But if you don't believe what this book says, if you don't have faith, even though someone brings it to you, and you have the knowledge of it, if you don't have faith to reach out and accept it and believe it, it'll do you no good. Many years ago, it was late night. I have a dear friend that he, over the years, he's driven me to a lot of revival meetings, special services. And I had a service one night that I had to go about four hours each way to get to that service. And he said, why don't you let me drive you, preacher? I know you're tired. I'd like to drive. I said, it's a long drive. Three and a half to four hours for sure. He said, that's okay. He said, I can make arrangements, go and work a little later tomorrow. I'd like to drive you. I said, well, I appreciate that. So that night, we got about 30 minutes from home. We're coming down from northern Ohio. And we come through one of the little towns there. And all of a sudden, uh, there's flashing lights behind us. And he pulls over. And when he pulls over, uh, I immediately think that he is going to get his license out, his registration. But when he pulls over, he just sits with his hands on the steering wheel. He had already put his window down, and he sits with his hands on the steering wheel. And I'm looking at him. I think, that's strange. The law's just pulled us over. They're going to want his license. They're going to want his registration in Ohio. That's the typical procedure. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> but that is the typical procedure. And he just sits there with his hands on the steering wheel. He doesn't move. And I said, are you going to get your license? It'll be okay, preacher. Just a minute. And I said, do you need your registration? He said, It'll be okay. Just a minute, preacher. I notice the officer shines his flashlight into the side view mirror until it bounces back in his eyes until the driver can't see, but he keeps his hand on the steering wheel. And I hear him say, I don't have my weapon with me. He's an officer of the court. And in his license, it's registered, and he knew it was registered, that he usually carries a concealed weapon with him everywhere that he goes. But he was letting the law enforcement officer know, I don't have my concealed weapon with me tonight. I'm not on official duty, so I don't have that with me right now. Do you know something? If the devil ever pulls you over, you ought to be able to say to him, I'm packing faith. I'm packing hope, and I'm packing charity. You better watch out, because I've got three concealed weapons that if I don't give those three things up, do you realize that's greater than any gun? Years ago, I was preaching a revival way down south. I was in one of the metropolitan cities preaching. And there was a dear old saint of God, elderly saint of God. A fella had broken out of prison. And of all the houses to pick in that whole city, he picked her house to come into. And he came into her house and he was there and he forced his way through the door. He said, he said, I want you to sit down. She said, yes, sir, I'll sit down. She sat down. He said, I'm telling you, you don't call the law. She said, I'm not calling the law. She said, I don't have to call the law. 
He said, do you know who I am? She said, no. He said, I just broke out of prison. She said, I don't care. He said, do you know what I'm in prison for? She said, I don't care. He said, do you know that I'm charged with crimes and have done things that if you knew what I did, you'd be afraid? She said, no, I wouldn't. And he said, what do you mean? She said, because the Lord is my shepherd. And she said, may I remind you you're in his house. And she said, young man, your only problem is you needed a mother and a daddy that raised you in church and tell you the right thing. And if you touch me, you're going to have to go through the Lord. By the time the law came, he called the law on himself and got saved at her couch because she had faith, hope, and charity. Jesus said, I pray for Peter. Peter, I'm praying for you. That your faith fail not. Yep. That is strange. Day. He didn't say, Peter, I'm praying that you won't fail. He knew Peter would fail. He knows that our best, I don't care what we do and how hard we try, at our best, there's times we just fail. But can I tell you, faith never fails. Faith isn't that thing that we have that keeps us from getting knocked down. Faith sometimes we forget that it's there because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God is planted like a seed in our heart and sometimes we're hit with things that we don't know how it will turn out. But sooner or later, right on time, every time, God waters the faith and it springs up and God says, I've given you what you need to face this thing. Faith doesn't keep you from getting knocked down. But faith is what helps you to start making plans right away on what you're going to do when you get back up. Faith helps you to get on your feet again. I preached here a while back a message and I said, you know, I deal with a lot of sick people. It goes with ministry. You know, you pray for your people. You're there for your people through a lot of sickness. And a lot of times, I'll encourage people if they've been sick for a period of time in their home. It's not unusual for me if I talk to some of our elderly folks. And I'll say, how you been doing today? Doing okay. I said, are you feeling any better? No, not much better. And then they'll start telling me, I went to the doctor yesterday I gotta go have lab work done tomorrow. Now I, I gotta go the next day and have a CAT scan. And then they're sending me on to another doctor in a week. And then I then I gotta go have this test done. And and they'll start down their calendar and they'll tell me 30 things that they've got coming up. And they've got it all marked down and all dated down. And every now and then I'll stop them. I said, now, now just where on your cal calendar did you put down? On this day, God's going to raise me up. And I'm going to get back to church. I better move on. That didn't go over very good. I know people get sick. And I know people get down. That's the problem right now through this coronavirus. Everybody, they recognize the virus and they got out of church. And now I'm glad for live stream like everybody else. But they forgot to mark their coming back day. He may knock us down, but I don't plan to stay down. I know somebody that has power to help us get back. Do you carry that weapon of faith? Do you carry that weapon of hope? May be concealed right now, but I promise you, it's the anchor of your soul, and when you need it, hope will come up. God gives us hope all the way to the end of the journey. But when hope is suddenly turned to reality, and hope becomes reality, and that which we hope for is seen, we no longer hope for that. There's coming a time when we won't need hope anymore. But I'm glad he gives us hope until we get to that place. Hope. What do you mean by that? Well, 
Let me give you a couple quick examples. When I was a boy growing up, uh, my, my first dog, his name was Shep. He was a German Shepherd. Boy, I'm original on naming dogs, aren't I? We called him Shep. And he was a large German Shepherd, and we lived out in the country, and everybody lived in the country. You, you didn't have, uh, you know, you didn't have security alarms and all that. We had dogs. That was our guards, was guard dogs. And Shep, uh, he had a way uh, that, that, you know, you had to, if you had him, when he was outside, you had to keep him chained. And you didn't use a little chain, you had to keep him chained. And one day, our neighbor had chickens. And the chickens got loose. We had a chain on Shep that I was sure that he couldn't break it, but the chickens got loose and ran in front of him. And all of a sudden, Shep saw those chickens. And that chain so helped me. It was like, it was like paper. He broke out that chain and he had them chickens before we could turn around. Now, I was raised that, you know, if somebody damages the property of somebody else, you restore it to them. You make restitution. And I got to thinking about that years later. Now, Shep had never done that before. Why did he break that chain? And how could he break that chain so easy? And then I realized there was something in front of him that was stronger than the chain that held him. Now faith is the anchor and hope is the anchor rather of our soul. And faith has brought that anchor to pass. Faith and hope are anchor and the chain. Hope is the chain. Faith is the anchor. And that doesn't keep us from drifting. Any of you have a boat, you know when you anchor down, you still drift. The purpose of the anchor is to keep you from drifting. It's to keep you from drifting too far. But old Shep saw something in front of him that was stronger than the chain. Do you know when the Lord calls us and we get ready to leave here, we're going to see something in front of us that the chains of this body can no longer hold us here. The silver cord will be broken and we'll rise to meet him in the air. And a dear friend... Clyde Perry, bless his heart, he was a great man of God. He taught camp meetings with me all over this country. He would teach camp meetings. Some of you, I know you've heard him teach in some of our camp meetings. We'd have a 6 o'clock session, 7 o'clock session. We'd, we'd start worshiping at 6 o'clock. He'd always teach. And Clyde had never married. He was a great pastor. Never been married. As he got older, his wife his uh, mother was elderly and his sister was married. And he and his sister had the job of taking care of their mother. And Clyde, being a man of God, never been married, he, he told his sister, I'll take on all the responsibility that I can. His mother had cancer. And he was setting up the nights because he'd go out and preach. He'd come back in from preaching. He'd set up on the nights with, to give his sister the break of the nights. And she'd come in back into the days. He'd get ready to go preach again or teach in camp meetings. And his mother got in severe pain. He said, it was unbearable for me to watch. And said, one night, early morning, two, three o'clock in the morning, said, I heard my mother's voice. She said, Clyde. He ran to her bedside and said, yes, mom, what is it? And she said, do you see that over there? And he said, see what, mom? He said, well, all those little children, what are they doing here? They're singing, they're, they're holding hands, they seem so happy and they're waving for me. I've never seen them. Clyde said, I was tired. I'd been preaching and setting up in the nights. And he said, I just lost presence of mind for a moment. And he said, oh, Mom, they've got you on some strong medication. He said, it's just the medicine. Try to go back to sleep. He didn't mean to say anything wrong. He was just tired, and you know how you do. You just say something to try to help them. And he said, for two weeks, his mother was in pain like he'd never seen anybody in. 
in all of his years of preaching and pastoring. He said, I'd sit and cry because there wasn't anything that I could do. The medicine no longer would work. Nothing would help her. He said, two weeks passed by. And he said, about two or three o'clock in the morning, my mother called my name. Said, I was right there by her bed. Said, yes, Mom. She said, Clyde, they're back. <laughs> he said, you just go on to them, Mom. And said, in a few minutes, she was in the presence of the Lord. Amen. You know what? Hope became reality. But until we get to that place, He gives us faith, He gives us hope, and He gives us charity or love. If you don't have that, nothing else matters. So they can take anything they want to take. They can do anything they want to do to us. But whatever you do, don't let them take your faith. Don't let them take your hope. And don't let them take your charity or love. Someone a few weeks ago said, Preacher, I really don't understand. Why do you go like that? Why do you keep going like that? Night and day. Week after week. You're getting older. You need to slow down. Why, why do you keep doing that? And I, I didn't mean, I didn't mean to be arrogant, and I didn't mean to be hard. And I said, you just don't understand. I don't do it because I have to. I do it because I love to do it. I feel sorry for people that feels like it's hard to go to church. I really do. I feel sorry for people that feels like it's a chore to worship God. I feel sorry for people that feels like it's a burden to read their Bible. I feel sorry for people that feels like they don't have enough time to ever pray. I feel sorry for people that feel like they just don't have anything that they can afford to give to help somebody else. I'm telling you why we do what we do, all of us. The greatest commandment is love. If you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, you don't have to beg people to come to church if they love the Lord. You don't have to beg people to give their money if they love the Lord. You don't have to beg people to invite others to church if they love the Lord. You don't have to, you don't have to beg them to praise God if they love the Lord. What are you carrying on you tonight? Do you have faith? Do you have hope? Do you have love? D.L. Moody's motto in life was, if I can convince a person I love them, I can win them to Christ. More people have come to know the Lord through simple acts of love of God's people going out of their way to be a blessing and a help to someone that doesn't know Christ, just the little things in life that impacts their life, that makes them see that person loves the Lord. Have you ever met somebody and said, boy, they've got faith? You ever met somebody and say, boy, they've got a hope? You ever met somebody and say, boy, that person sure loves the Lord? How do you know that? Well, I guess they didn't have concealed carry. They were open carry. Open with their love. Open with their faith. Open with their hope. Your heads are bowed throughout the sanctuary. Pastor, who you want to sing? Praise God. Praise God. Sharing them. Sharing them. If you'll come, sis, as they're coming.
Do you have faith? Do you have hope? Do you have love? They can take everything else away, but don't give those up. Make sure you have that. If you lose everything else, don't you lose that. I'm not saying that your faith won't be challenged. And I'm not saying that you won't be challenged to lose your hope. To give up on your love. I'm saying don't surrender it. Your heads are bowed and no one's looking on. Is there somebody here tonight you're having a problem with faith? You're having a problem with hope? You're having a problem with love? You say, well, I don't have those, preacher. I'm not saved. That's why you ought to get saved tonight. And for those of you that are saved, that you're in a challenge trying to make you surrender. The devil telling you, don't you believe God? He's let you down. Where's he at? They'll play a verse before they sing. If you're here tonight and there's a need in your life, spiritually, that you'd like me to pray for you, and you'd like God's people to pray for you, would you just raise your hand right now and say, I need that prayer. Please pray for me, preacher. Pray for me, church. If you'll raise your hand, I'll not call out anybody's name. I'll not single you out. God bless you. Somebody else, you just raise your hand. God bless you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. You can take it right back down if you want. Somebody else, you just raise your hand right now. You can raise your hand right now. That's me. Pray for me, preacher. Please pray for me. Please pray for me. Before they sing, you just raised your hand. Nobody's looking on, I promise you. Will you just look right here at me for one moment? Will you let the Lord help you tonight? You don't have to tell me what it is or anybody else. Right now, young person, see us. Will you just, will you just get up out of your seat right now and come and find your place right here to pray and let God's people come in and pray with you? Will you do that? God bless you, friend. How about you? Will you come too? Come right on, just like she's coming. You come too. Will you do that? Will you do that? Sure. Come right on. Bless you, see us. There's two here praying. I know you want to come and pray with them. Let's stand. Let's sing. And as we stand and sing, God knows their need. I want, I want God's people to pray for these that have come. Faith, hope, charity. Don't you surrender to God. You come. When the day is dark before you And the clouds are hanging low There is one who watches 
And later on, if you need to come and take us by the hand or come peck on our shoulder, hey, we'll come back in here and pray with you any which way we can help you. Uh, people, like you said, Pat,